Welcome back, Controls Champions. We're going to take you through this software now. We've been talking about Omron everything. Let's get into SysMag Studio a little bit and see how it works. I hope you're going to be able to see this. We weren't able to do a screen capture on, on this computer right now, but uh, We'll do our best with the camera and uh, do let me know if anything's unclear, you got questions. I'm gonna be making more videos on this in the near future. So we'll, we'll get your questions answered. I'm gonna let Thad do this overview because he's done it a million times and he's really good at it. And uh, like I say, we'll come back and answer questions later. Thad. Excellent, thanks John. So SysMac Studio, as we mentioned uh, earlier, Omron had released a, uh, a number of products under what we uh, what, are, what are termed the SysMac umbrella. Uh, so SysMac Studio is the software utility that is used by Omron for configuring uh, the machine automation controllers, their servos, uh, doing just standard logic control, uh, their safety, their HMIs, vision, and smart sensing, as well as robotics. So that is all incorporated into this one instance or one version of software. So what I'm gonna to do to start here is I'm gonna establish a connection with uh, the controller that we showed in, <clears throat> in the integrated video short, uh, short while ago. And what I'm gonna do is uh, show you the what's called the Multi-View Explorer. This is where we're gonna get started and this is pretty much where we're doing all of our configuration. What we do within the configuration uh, and setup element of this MultiView Explorer is we're going to start from the top and work our way down. So the first thing that you see listed at the top is called EtherCAT. Uh, what we'll simply do is go in, while we're connected to the processor, what we're going to do is we'll click on what's called Compare and Merge with the actual network configuration. What this is doing is it's going out and it's searching for what is physically connected on EtherCAT, and it's gonna report it back. So if we expand what is in the project versus what is really out there, and we take a look at what we see in the comparison result on the right, everything matches. <clears throat> if they did not match, or if this is a new configuration, all we would have to do is say, apply actual net network configuration everything that you see on the right would be applied to the left. Once we apply that, we can close this window. And as we mentioned, we're working from the top down. We would now go to the CPU expansion racks. Again, we would do the same concept of what we just did. Right click on the processor, compare and merge with the actual configuration. This is what is actually there. This is what's in the software configuration right now. If we wanted to apply it, we would just click on the button. Since everything matches, we can just hit OK. Going down to the I.O. map, this is where we would address any of our modules. So if we have input and output modules as an example, all of the EtherCAT nodes are going to be listed at the top based off of the connection order that we saw in the EtherCAT tab above. This is in the same order. We would go down to the physical modules, and this is where we can now apply our variable names. What you're gonna find in the Omron software is anytime you see something that is gray with a gray kind of background, it is not editable or changeable. If it is in a white background, it is editable. So this is where you would then apply those variable names. As Omron calls them, um, very similar to tag names that you might hear from uh, other manufacturers. Once these variable names are applied, what we would do is go back online with the processor. It's giving us a pop-up saying that we're also connecting to our safety controller. And then we would do what's called a, a synchronize. <clears throat> this is making sure whatever resides on the physical processor is the same as what's in the software, and then we would transfer that configuration. Okay, after we've uh, completed that, we can get down to whatever we want to set our IP address to. Notice that uh, 
As we mentioned in a previous video, there are the two ports on the NX102 series PLC. So as we see here, there are port one and port two settings. So both of these must reside on a separate subnet. So you'll notice the 192.168.2.1 versus the 251.1. They must reside on separate networks. Now you'll notice a lot of the other configuration options that are available with these ports. Um, if I were to point out the one that is probably the most common uh, when we're dealing with databasing or needing to capture uh, pro productivity data or quality data, a lot of times it's a timestamp as to when that was captured. So what is very frequently done is we use a network time protocol uh, that we would interface with a server that is maintaining the time so we don't have to worry about the processor drifting over time. It's, a, it's time clock drifting. Uh, so I'd say that's what's very common. Now one other thing that you can do as we're progressing here is you're going to notice all of these tabs that are open. If we wanted, this is where Omron software is very useful, is you can drag and drag these onto other screens. Um, if you simply want to return it, if you've got it uh, docked in an incorrect location, just simply double click on it, it goes right back to where it was. The next thing we'll take a look at is the motion control setup. So under motion control, you're going to see the axis settings. And if we right click on that, you can say add either a motion control axis or a single axis position control axis. Now, again, what this basically means is the single axis means you cannot do any coordinated motion. Motion control axis means you're going to do either coordinated motion, gearing, camming, or have an encoder input. So if we take a look at some of those that have been pre-configured, what we're doing is identifying the node that these were applied to and that it's going to be set up as a single axis position control. We have a servo axis, single axis, axis position control axis, and the node that it was applied to. As we're going through this, it's going to ask, okay, so what is the command pulse count per motor rotation? So what this is asking is if we do not have a gearbox in our system, how far will we travel in one rotation of the motor shaft. So if the motor shaft rotates 360 degrees, what is the mechanical linear distance of travel that we will travel? In this case it was 5.08 millimeters per rev and we will have 8,388,608 pulses per revolution of that shaft. <clears throat> Once we apply this we can now go in and identify some of the other configuration settings I'll just point out those that are, the that are the most common. The maximum velocity, this is what never to exceed. So as we're setting up our axis, we can either make this maximum velocity uh, uh, something that's system dependent or motor dependent. What I mean by that is the motors are going to be rated up to a maximum or a continuous maximum speed. And we want to set this to a maximum velocity at that maximum continuous speed rating or the mechanics of the system, we simply don't want this system to exceed a maximum velocity. This is where we would apply that. The maximum jog velocity is also something that we would need to set. That would need to be also the same or lower than the maximum velocity. The other configurations in this window would be what's called the in position range and the zero position range. The best way to describe this is when we're doing our logic programming and we use a motion control function block, something called like an MC move absolute. What's going to happen is you're going to see a done on the right hand side of that function block. And once we reach the value that we apply to this in position range, that is when that done bit will turn on. So some of the other settings, if we need to change the default torque settings. If we want to apply software limits for a linear, linear motion, we can do software limits. Uh, following error, this is if we want to apply a following error. So what this means is if you have a trapezoidal move profile and you apply uh, your actual motion profile over top of it, if the difference between the actual and the theoretically perfect are exceeding the value that's applied here, you'll end up with an error or a warning. So the zero position preset, this is for our homing method. So if we take a look at the options that are available, it gives us a nice little picture of 
how we will our homing routine will be working um, in this instance I used what's called the zero position preset what it means is that wherever you are right now when the MC home function block is triggered that will become your zero position now keep in mind that these are absolute servo motors that are battery free servo motors on the 1s servos so you only really need to home them once and they'll remember that where they are unless the motor gets decoupled from the actuator or mechanical system okay so that's a uh, and the last thing that we would look at is are we doing a linear motion or are we doing a rotary motion what do we want our rollover point to be so if we were doing some kind of rotary table when do we want to have that rollover of the encoder and the encoder type we want to set up as an absolute encoder uh, the last servo drive settings this is typically not something you have to worry about for Omron servos um, if you are using third-party ethercat servos you may need to configure this all right, moving down, if we had any camming, we can set up some camming profiles. Um, a nice one that I like to show is our uh, task settings. So as we come into our task, you'll get an idea of how fast the processors are. <clears throat> so the setting that I created here was for a 2.5 millisecond ceiling scan time, not to exceed. And as we're working through, you're going to see that all of the I.O. and all of the EtherCAT devices are applied to that primary task with that 2.5 milliseconds. Program assignment. So in this case, in my, in my uh, project, I only have one program. And it is applied to that primary task. So the last uh, item I want to show here in the task settings is what's called the Task Execution Time Monitor. So this is a means to identify what the average scan time is of the processor. In this case, it's 780 microseconds, and the maximum scan time was 972 microseconds. So with a 2.5 millisecond ceiling scan time, we're in a very comfortable spot right now. Uh, realistically, when we get to, uh, we'll say 80 to 90% of that maximum scan time, and this is kind of dependent upon the processor type that you're using, uh, but uh, once you reach that threshold, that's where you might want to consider creating a secondary program that would handle lower priority tasks. <clears throat> the next thing is data trace settings. So this is if we're going to be doing any troubleshooting. <clears throat> you can create a data trace. And this data trace will op uh, open up a uh, new window. You won't get that error because I'm running it in a uh, Oracle Virtual Box. <laughs> that doesn't have a 3D graphics accelerator. So this gives us a means to, it's essentially like an oscilloscope. It gives us a means to look, look at a value over time. And we can capture that and then we can overlay so we can actually isolate problems that we might be experiencing. And then you can uh, save those uh, for viewing later. The OPC UA, this is a standard for, op <clears throat> for interfacing with other uh, software or hardware based uh, heart uh, devices uh, what that allows you to do is share, share all of the global variables that are published with an external device uh, seamlessly it just makes them instantly available on the network uh, benefit of doing such is it provides uh, uh, certs it prov provides securities for the connection so it makes it very secure so you don't have to worry about someone coming in and uh, accessing that data um, this processor also supports databasing. So when we come into the databasing, what it's going to do is ask you what is the IP address or the host name that you're interfacing to, the port number, what is the database name, and then what's the login credentials for it. So once we establish all of that, um, go online with the processor, it'll come back and it'll ask us if we want to do a communication test. And if we're, we have that database on, that network on these connections it'll come back and say test okay so that is an instantaneous method for a lot of customers if they want to test if they can access their database directly this is something we can do in just a simple demo um, we have done this in the past for some customers where we just connected it and it just worked and uh, we've had a lot of success with that so the program zero, you'll notice down at the bottom, um, now that we've configured all of our initial uh, devices configuration setup, 
we'll go in and start working on our code. <clears throat> now, one of the things I want to point out within the code is that Omron has an ability to do what's called inline structured text. So you'll see your standard ladder logic, but then you can also do what's called inline structured text. This is for all extensive purposes, a very uh, advanced structured text language where you can get up to a thousand lines of code within one of these windows. This is very powerful for doing things like uh, for next loops for populating data uh, over, over uh, a, 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 an array of uh, elements or just to make things faster. So I could have done a for next loop and what I did right here. <laughs> so this shows uh, examples of how you can use combinations of ladder logic and structured text. Quite honestly, both of them have benefits and having that combination and taking advantage of each of their strengths is really something that is uh, very beneficial. So if we come down and now take a look at uh, perhaps like the SQL configuration, um, this is just examples of what we can do within the um, layout for accessing a database to either insert data, append data, query data, or delete through the data in a database. Now this is doing that interface directly. We can also do what's called stored procedures. And those stored procedures mean all of that uh, logic resides in the database itself. And we're just calling to that stored procedure. So it's gonna run that stored procedure. So uh, we don't have to worry about uh, maximizing uh, uh, space within our process here. We can, we can do it uh, within the database itself. <clears throat> Taking a look at uh, the homing section of the code. This is if we're homing to a hard stop. Essentially what we're gonna be doing is turning on the servo axis itself, identifying what torque limit we want to apply. We don't wanna have the, the servo using all of its torque capacity to go and slam into an end stop. Uh, that's definitely not something we wanna do, so we're gonna really dial back that torque that's available to the motor such that it will run into that end stop. Once we do that, we'll stop and then we'll back off of that uh, defined distance. And that's what's being done in this code. The last is uh, the servo routine, how we had the servos going back and forth at a uh, slower rate, five times, finishing that cycle and then doing five times at a higher rate. That is what's being done in this, in this section of code. And to take a look at the data types, this is our, our user defined structures. So we can create any form of structure uh, that we want for either our code or if we're doing Ethernet IP interfacing, this is something that's very commonly done as well. The global variables will access all of this data and you'll have the data type column that associates to what type of data it is, whether it's a structure or whether it's just a, a predefined data type. And then if we wanna make those available to some device uh, on the network. So this is a very quick snapshot. Uh, within this, you'll also notice that there are options to go in to take a look at the safety CPU as well as the HMI. And you'll notice the icons change every time you go into one of those different sections. So this is a very quick snapshot on what you can uh, expect to see within uh, Omron SysMac Studio software. If there are other questions relating to this, as I said earlier, we're here to help. We never want anyone to get frustrated with anything they're working on. Please call. Thank you, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. If there's one thing I like more than making these videos, it's hearing what you have to say about them. So, um, Leave a comment, share, like, or subscribe. Ooh.